It's over. The Bucks have done it. The long wait has ended after a half century. The Milwaukee Bucks are NBA champions once again. The emotions come pouring out. One of the greatest nights in Milwaukee sports history ends in a coronation. Welcome to the front office. I am Bobby Marks, and today I am joined by John Horst, the general manager of the world champion, Milwaukee Bucks, and more important, the pride of Sandusky, Michigan. Not Ohio, Michigan. Uh, John, how are you? I'm great, Bobby. Thanks for having me on. It's great to have a conversation with you and looking forward to it. Well, I think, that, I think when I say that the, uh, the world champion, that never gets old, right? Never. No, never. That's, that's uh, my good friend Andy Ellsberg told me is I'll be a champion for the rest of my life. So I guess I have a long time to celebrate. Your path to where you are right now um, is unique. You know, nothing has ever been given to you. And you, know, you graduate from Rochester College. You play basketball there. Um, two national championships, I believe, um, yeah. there. You do two years of an unpaid internship with the Pistons, which nowadays, I, I don't think they're even allowed. You finally get hired by the Pistons in 08. You transition to Milwaukee um, with uh, John Hammond. Uh, you rise through that organization there and you get named general manager. And that's where you are right now. And it's kind of a two-part question for you. What, what do you remember that stands out um, during that internship when you did it with the Pistons? Yeah, people from executives and leaders and coaches and assistant coaches to our players, um, support staff, just the uh, the feeling of family that existed in that organization that was at the, really the top of the league at that time, had an incredible run. Um, just really great people, a great family setting, um, you know, and, and people that I'm frankly just still close with today. And so the first thing I always think about with that time in Detroit was the people. I read something about when you were doing your internship there that your, your dad was giving you some grief, right? Like, when are you going to start making money, right? Like, and you did, I mean, like you had some odd end jobs, right? FedEx, Bed Bath & Beyond, you worked at the you know, mobile home. When you look at those type of experiences and what you've done in the NBA, um, you know, over the last, you know, 13, 14 years, how, how does that kind of have shaped you to, to the person you are right now? Yeah, I think work ethic, like I still believe in that. And, and you know, our, our parents um, came from a different generation. You know, we're in a certain generation, the, the people that are younger than us. Everyone has a different approach on, on what work is and what success is. Um, but I learned from a young age that it was really about, you know, work ethic and biding your time and paying your dues. And um, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in sports. I didn't know what the role would be or what the opportunity would be, but I wanted to work in sports. Um, and in particular basketball. And I was kind of willing to do whatever it would take to get there. And um, that meant working a lot of odd jobs and doing a lot of different things, stocking shelves at night and working at trailer parks and all the things that you kind of talked about. And um, I just think that that approach has worked well for me. It's, it's not a, a cookie cutter approach, I think, for success in our world. And I've learned that uh, day in and day out as I see how other people have risen and had success. But for me, it was to just put in everything I could and, and buy my time and pay my dues and be ready for every opportunity that came at me and take advantage of it. And so um, I think those are all parts of my story and parts of the success that I've had so far that um, I'm not uh, regretful or, or, or harbor anything toward any of those things except for, you know, good feelings and positive feelings and kind of how it helped me grow and develop. So, you know, the last three years have been a roller coaster with you know, COVID comes March of 2020, and it feels like we've gotten three seasons, right? Kind of rolled into one. So you guys win the championship in, in, in late July. Then we go to the, we go to draft, the draft, and then free agency. It's kind of like just, we haven't really, you haven't really come up for air, it feels like. Have you ever had a time during, you know, the last six months where you've had a chance to kind of reflect what this organization was able to accomplish um, last year? I think there's been moments, especially when you kind of lay it out like that. I mean, you talked about this, this most recent run. I think, you know, we've been, we're at some position or some point along this really long journey in our franchise. And I don't know exactly where we're at there. I know we're not at the end and, you know, we're beyond the beginning. It's, it's, the goal has always been to get better every day, sustain success, be in a position to win year in and year out and have a chance year in and year out. We've done that a few times. Um, 
we won once. And um, I think throughout that so far, we've had chances to look back and reflect. And I think that's healthy. I think balance is healthy, but we don't spend much time looking back and we don't spend much time reflecting to kind of go back. What I said about Andy before, I think, I mean, we're going to be a champion forever, no matter what there's, that will never be taken away from this group and all the individuals that make up this group. So we have a long time to kind of celebrate and reflect on it. And I think we're a little more focused on moving forward and trying to um, create another one of those windows, another one of those opportunities. But, you know, the parade was a great moment of reflection, a great moment of celebration. I'm sure we'll find others along the way. It feels like um, we've all lived two NBA lives. Uh, the first part before March of 2020, as far as pre-COVID, right? That was challenging in itself as far as running a front office, working in the NBA. Now we got part two post-COVID, right? Where we're in right now. How challenging has it been from a front office standpoint the last, I guess we're almost on two years, um, dealing with everything that's had to come with, with COVID? Yeah, I mean, these past two plus years have been crazy. And I think it's been for everyone, right? And not necessarily just a front office of a professional sports team, but the league, you know, what the league has had to do. And, and I think what players have had to do and people in other industries and families that support them. Um, what I think about or what I'm most concerned about is the care for the people that are involved. I, I just think that um, in most cases, people are having to do one or two or three times um, as many jobs as they had to do prior to this. And then it's mostly related to testing and, and um, you know, protocols and quarantines and, and just making sure that we're doing everything we can to be safe and healthy. And so um, there's a lot of people that are feeling uh, the brunt of that load and that lift on a daily basis. And um, we care at a high level, you know, how we support those people and resource them and, and make sure that they're uh, being taken care of as we go through this, because it's a lot. And it's a lot, like I said, it's not just a lot for the people that are doing it. It's a lot for the families that are experiencing it, the players that have to wade through it. Um, I don't know if we've done it well or not, but I know that we care about it and we've tried. And, and it's the thing that I think has been the most difficult that I care the most about is how are we taking care of the people that are really executing these um, initiatives and, and I mean, the league has done an amazing job. I, I think about those people all the time I and mean, they've had to take on so much of a lift here to help us get through this, but we've done it. I mean, we've had very little interruption, um, relatively speaking to our business and our operation. And that's really a credit to everyone involved. So I asked Kobe Altman this question when we did our last um, episode um, about game day rituals, right? And he mentioned to me that he chews not the same gum, but the same brand of gum for every game right? That's kind of his thing. Do you have any game day rituals that you kind of go through, you know, maybe a little bit different during the regular season than the playoffs, but is there something that kind of a routine you do? Not, not as fun as Kobe's. <laughs> um, I, uh, I love to hoop. So uh, on the road, you know, our pickup hoops will usually be post shoot around. That's, that's uh, training staff, coaches, um, myself, maybe a couple front office guys if they're with us. Like, uh, so I love to hoop on the road and at home, you know, a couple hours before game time, before I have over to the arena, my staff. And so that's uh, not as fun as chewing gum during the game, but I think that's a, a pretty consistent ritual and routine for me. It's, it's, I don't get to execute it every single game, obviously, but it's, it's uh, kind of my happiness and my release. And then the other one is a little more in game and kind of fun is, uh, you know, I miss my kids and my wife a lot. As you know, with this job, you travel a lot, you're gone a lot. And so no matter where we're at in the game, if it's pregame, if it's halftime, if it's the middle of a quarter, um, I call my, my wife and kids every night before they go to bed if I'm not with them. So those are kind of the two things that happen pretty consistently for me um, relative to games. I'm going to ask a second part to this question. You guys are down 2-0 in the NBA Finals to Phoenix. You tie it up, right? You go back for game five. Did you do anything different? Did you sit in a different seat? Did you go to a different restaurant maybe? So you want the truth on this, right? This <laughs> yeah. like full, full access. So did not play pickup hoops that day. Okay. Um, you know, actually got, I should have, I should have been a little more general. It's, it's exercise, usually hoops. So sometimes, you know, games one and two in Phoenix, so nice, warm, we got out and played tennis and kind of got out and did some activities that way. So game five, there's this, uh, we stay at the Phoenician. There's this, you know, it kind of this great mountain hill, whatever in the background of the hotel. So I went on a hike by myself early in the morning, got up early, hiked up kind of the top of it, sat up there for a while, listened to some music and whatever, and came down. So I don't know if that'll be my playoff Phoenix routine only, or, you know, there's not always a, a warm weather hike available for a uh, pregame, but 
that one was unique and different. There was no hoops that day. <laughs> and it worked out well for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Win or lose. Do you have somebody that you use as a sounding board? You're driving home, right? Like first person you call when you're in the car driving home as kind of as a sounding board. Yeah, not as consistent for me. I think um, I do occasionally or, or maybe even frequently love reaching out to our guys, you know, post game um, and, you know, just call call a player or two on my way home and just thank them for, you know, playing great that night, the effort they might have had. Maybe something happened and just, you know, to catch up with them, make sure they're all right. But that's that's a kind of consistent, inconsistent one would be players. The uh, the sounding board is like this family chat, right? So yeah. I have I have two brothers. I have a sister. Um my mom, my dad, my, my in-laws, my sister-in-law and brothers and brother-in-law um, were on this family chat and they're very religious with the chat with the Bucks games and they're very consistent and engaged. And so um, sometimes it's a nice release to kind of see their commentary and to see their passion of a game and just like uh, go back and forth. And so that's that's probably the thing I use the most. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all over the board. Sometimes it could be talking to a coach, um, to our owners, to Peter Fagan, checking in. Um, for me, it's not that one person every single game that I always talk to. It's it's, but there is always some sort of communication that's helpful. When I a quick story, when I started with the Nets and doing my internship, my first year, my sounding board was my mom. And what what happened, John, is I would come from when I was still living at home. I'd come home, and my mom would basically write out a, like a scouting report of the game. Mostly, it was pretty critical. It wasn't all positives, and we would like like midnight sit in the kitchen and she would go, go through like what went wrong. And I was like, Oh my goodness. Like, I don't, I don't want to hear this right now. Right. This is a stressful job. As you know, it, you know, you get judged by wins and losses. I mean, that's kind of the reality of it, but when you do want to kind of get away from things, NBA wise, like kind of just as a little bit of a stress reliever, like what do you, what do you like to do? Yeah, I mean, I, besides exercise, exercise is great for me, you know, running, biking, you know, playing hoops, um, being with my family kind of in my roots, you know, so so whether it's actually where I grew up in Sandusky, Michigan, not Sandusky, Ohio, which is significantly smaller, um, or something like that, you know, being out in the woods, being in a field, uh, being on the lake, um, just different things like that, kind of a little bit away from technology, removed from the phone um, with my family is really kind of my release. And it could be sitting around a bonfire with my brothers and my parents and my sister um, or camping with the kids, you know, it's, it's things like that is kind of how I grew up. And so getting back to that for, for moments of time has been really good for me. You've had a lot of mentors in your career. Um, who's the one person that you've kind of leaned on the most? I'm glad you said that. Cause there have been a lot and, and <laughs> it could be a whole show kind of just talking about that <laughs> meant to me. Um, but I mean, none more than John Hammond. I mean, working side by side, hand in hand with him for 12 years, 12 plus years, um, learned uh, a ton from him. Um, he's given so much to me and my family. He's the best, you know, and, you know, still talk to him all the time, still need him all the time and lean on him for things. And, um, you know, just forever grateful. So many for sure. Um, none more than him. And I mean, it'd be a great time. And we almost have to talk about Rod Thorne on this. Like, <laughs> like Rod, Rod gave so much to me in, in the couple of years that I was able to work with him as a mentor and a leader and just someone who I learned a ton from, um, you know, before I had this position and then after I had this position, I know he meant a lot to you as well. So I uh, love Rod. And like, so I'll mention him and John. Yeah. When we talk about superstitions. So when I worked in New Jersey with Rod um, at the old Meadowlands, we would sit in suite 119. Um, there, there, it was, you know, that building is old and it's an enclosed glass suite and it would be R R Rod and myself were the only two people who sat in there. Occasionally he would have a, Gail Goodrich would come in and sit with us, right? Some legendary players. And I sat in the front pinned against the ball and Rod sat behind like a bar seating. And I learned whenever Rod asked me a question, not to answer because whatever I was going to say was probably not going to be the right, right thing. And we did that for 10 years of home yeah. games sitting in that, that, uh, that one suite here, but yeah, he's, he's meant a lot to me. And I know, um, you know, your relationship with him is, uh, you know, something, something unique and, uh, and special also. So, yeah, he's great. Um, if you weren't running a basketball team in a different world, what do you think you'd be doing? And it's so hard because it's like my whole life has been sports and um, 
the thing that I'm continuing to learn and that I learned, you know, really in my internship with the Pistons, I had no clue going into it. Um, so much of what we do, I think, translates to the business world. And so if not, you know, in the arena of sports, I just think I'd be finding a way to team build, you know, um, on the business side, you know, in whatever industry that would be and taking a company and pushing it and growing it and trying to develop it, you know, using creativity and teamwork and kind of the things that we do here, hopefully well. And so I, I, I'm very curious, you know, about the business world. I'm very interested in, in business kind of outside of um, basketball and outside of sport. And so I'm sure it would look something like that. I'm sure you've gotten a lot of pieces of advice throughout your career, not from people on social media or on Twitter, but uh, real life advice. What's, what's one thing that's kind of stood out for you that, that, that you've gotten? Yeah, I'll give you two because I'll, you mentioned mentors, so I'm not going to tell you which one. I'm, I'm glad I mentioned two names. So it's one of the two. Uh, it's really simple, really direct, and it was really impactful. It was slow the blank down. So that expletive, you can fill it in. Uh, and emphatic, just slow down. Um, that was really helpful and continue to continues to be helpful for me day in and day out. Uh, the other one was just, you know, surround yourself with great people. Don't, don't take yourself too seriously and have a lot of fun because this is hard enough on its own. And if you don't have the balance, you don't have perspective, um, it can weigh on you quickly and it can it really kind of impact, you know, I think things that you do well or you don't do well. So uh, those two have been uh, very, very helpful for me. We're going to wrap this up with two more questions here. We'll get you out of here. I know. You got an important job there running this team outside of winning the championship in July. What's been your most proud accomplishment? Could be personal, could be what you've accomplished in Detroit and Milwaukee. But what's that one thing that's kind of stood out? Yeah, I mean, we'll stay kind of thematic with the box in the career. I, I think it's um, being a part of a, a group that hired a head coach. You know, you've worked in this business for a long time it's actually really hard to hire a head coach and to, to, um, to be right. You know, Mike Blumhoser is the right guy. He's a, he was the right guy for this franchise. He continues to be, um, to go through that process and to get it right. Um, I'm really proud of, of the group for doing that. And then I think keeping our players, I mean, Giannis and Chris and Brooke and Drew and Bobby and George, and I kind of go on down the list. These guys, Pat Connaughton, these guys have chosen to stay in Milwaukee. They've all had free agent opportunities. They've all been valuable sought after players. And they chose to stay with our franchise. And, and that's a group effort, a team effort. Really a credit to them. And I'm thankful for them for doing that. Um, forever thankful for them. Um, but I think that's another kind of, I think, moment of pride for the organization. Those two things. All right. My last question. And I don't want to get you in trouble with the, the restaurants in Milwaukee here. You can give me a couple. What's your favorite restaurant in downtown Milwaukee? Yeah. So I'll give you a couple. Um, so, you know, Ardent is kind of a, a real you know, kind of wine tasting, kind of, you know, foodie, fun, um, high-end, fun, fun restaurant. Um, love that. Love that experience. I've done that, you know, with Coach Bud and Peter Fagan and some of our guys. I think that's that's a ton of fun. Um, you know, my family and I, we love, especially the summers in Milwaukee are amazing. Get down by the river, get down by the lake. Um, there's this fun, great vibe place called Barnacle Buds. And, you know, get black and fish, you get a po' boy sandwich, you know, long, you know, Long Island iced tea, Arnold Palmer, whatever it is, but just kind of sit on the river and watch the boats kind of come in and out. My kids love to go there and get their fish fries, hang out. So that's, that's our most fun kind of most visited family place that we like to do in the summer. Uh, but Milwaukee has such a great restaurant scene and, and I'm thankful and lucky to kind of try out a lot of them. And you, I know you've been here, but those, those are the ones that jump out. I feel like that was a recruiting pitch to free agents right there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, we got to do what we got to do whenever we can. <laughs> well, John, I want to thank you uh, for coming on. I appreciate you spending some time. I know you're real busy, but um, I want to thank you and um, good luck the rest of the way. Stay, uh, stay uh, safe out there. Thanks, Bobby. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Take yep, care. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube for live streaming sports and premium content. Subscribe to ESPN plus.